it's really my joy to invite our next our, our speaker this evening, uh, Vivi Raman, who is well known. He's currently the director. He's an emeritus professor for the physics and humanities at the Rochester Inst Institute of Technology. He got his PhD in physics from the University of Paris, has written many books and articles, is really considered to be an expert in Hindu religion and um, what its relationship would be to modern science. Um, he's been a professor of physics for over three decades obtained his doctorate in theoretical physics at the Sorbonne under the tutelage of a Nobel laureate, Louis de Broglie, and maintains linguistic capabilities in French, German, Spanish, and classic Sanskrit. He can re re recite Vedic hymns and the Paternoster in Latin. Um, so his, his interests are wide ranging. He returned to India for research at the Sahai Institute of Nuclear Physics and later received a post with UNESCO. Um, he was elected senior fellow at the Metanexis Institute, received the Raha Rao Award for contributions to the literature of South Asia diaspora, serves on the board of the Hickey in Center for Interfaith Studies, and is on the editorial boards of Zygon and the Science and Theology Journal. His interests, his books are many, um, but uh, just to name a few, a uh, variety of humans, ubiquitous God, variety in religion and science, um, we're delighted to have him here today. He's going to talk about universality in a multi-ethnic world. Vivi, I'm going to give it to you to take it away. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the initial confusion we experienced. As we all know, culture, ethnicity, ethnocentrism, and all these terms have uh, become very dominant in our own times and uh, major for public discussion. But like many other ideas that have cropped up quite unexpectedly in the 21st century, these are uh, not always very pleasant. Uh, in this lecture, I would like to reflect a little bit on some of these from a general point of view, as well as from a historical perspective. So uh, first, let us talk about the roots of this word culture, which is the central theme today. Uh, cultures in human societies, as we know, arose from two or three specific capacities of the human spirit. One of them is a creativity, which human beings somehow have acquired over our evolutionary period. Then our capacity for imagination. And finally, our capacity for what may be called psychological bonding. That is, of course, physical bonding amongst many other creatures, but the psychological bonding is something peculiar, perhaps, to uh, humans as far as we know. Now, there are several dimensions, as we know, of being human, and one of them is being very personal, the personal aspect of each one of us. We have a life of our own in many ways. But then there is also a connected life. It is not possible practically to live without being connected in some way or other to fellow human beings. Now, these connections are of a variety of uh, kinds. First, there is a connection with kid and kin, our family members, which is probably the very first connection as babies with the mother and parents and siblings and so on. And then there is a social connection, no matter where we are, there are other persons in the community, we have to communicate with them in many ways. And then there is also group connections. We are 
part of a group. Most often it is by choice. We are welcomed or not. Generally, we are welcome in a group. And then there is a connection as being member of a nation. We all have our national connections. And then there is the international connections. We have connections with other people all over the world. And this can be either direct or in our own <coughs> times, it can be electronic connections as well. Now, in this context, we may look upon culture as a totality of several intangible elements that are present in our collective life as human beings. And this totality can again be analyzed a little later. They enrich our life every in many, many different ways, and they add meaning to life. And they bind us thanks to our propensity for psychological bonding. They bind us as groups and uh, these elements, however, differ from group to group. The question then is, how do we recognize these various aspects of culture? Well, there are the visible aspects, clearly, uh, dress, food, traditions, arts, crafts, and so on. These are the visible aspects of culture. And what is interesting is that these may be uh, experienced besides ours, we can also share this culture with others. And in fact, this kind of sharing invariably enriches our own lives. And in some cases, our cultures also, when we incorporate elements from other cultures. But then there are also several invisible aspects of culture. And these are the beliefs and values, for instance, and uh, they constitute a yeah, very important aspect of culture. And again, the worldview, what we call the worldview, is another extremely important aspect of culture, which comes essentially from those beliefs and values. And anyone belonging to any particular culture is invariably conditioned by, influenced by, inspired by the worldview of that culture. And, but that worldview is formed by several elements, the components of which include the language. Every culture has its own languages. And there is also the religion, which becomes part of our worldview. And there is, uh, the appearance of uh, which makes it sometimes feel closer to other members. And aside from these, there are the creative elements of culture. And uh, as we all know, they include art and music. By and large, that is what one refers to as specific to your culture. Then there is literature and poetry. And uh, last but not the least, we have to mention foods, which are part of every culture. Now, the variety of cultures in our world is absolutely stunning. We live in a world with many cultures, 
In fact, if an extraterrestrial were to visit the world and uh, conscious, intelligent extraterrestrial and visit different parts of the world, one would consider that they are coming to a museum because that's what the variety of cultures is all about. And uh, it is, each of these brings enormous delight and enrichment and meaning to the members of the group. And blessed are those who can taste or experience more than one culture because that enriches their experiences enormously. Now, when we talk about ethnicity, it refers often to not only to the commonality that is in a culture, fellow members, but it includes a certain empathy with others of the culture. That's, in fact, uh, what is meant by ethnicity. You find a certain commonality to the extent that you feel more at home with the members of uh, that uh, group. Now, there was a time in human history, uh, not too long ago, one might say, in terms of the length of uh, human history, when uh, cultures were confined to or linked to uh, nations and regions. We talk of cultures, Scottish, American, Indian, Chinese, and so on. They were confined to particular nations. And as we all know, this has changed considerably in our own times. And we talk of multicultural nations. In fact, there are probably very few nations today in the world which have only one particular culture. Many of them are rich in their multiculturalism. There are a few which are very uh, monocultural, and there are some in which the other cultures are a minority, say a negligible minority compared to the overwhelming majority. And this too, as we all know, is changing. Now, another characteristic of uh, ethnic groups is that there are in fact, an enormous number of ethnic groups in the world. It has, by one estimate, I found there are about 650 different ethnic groups uh, in 190 different countries, uh, all spread all over the world. And to have a culture is one thing, and to belong to the ethnic group is, is slightly more because it also involves a certain uh, degree of what one might call pride. The pride in the ethnic group is so much part of being human in today's world that it does not depend on one's nationality. You can be in New Zealand and be proud of being a Chinese, for example. And likewise, you can be uh, in France and be proud of being an Algerian. So this is, uh, but the pride associated with an ethnic group is very different from what may be called the pride of belonging to a nation or to uh, but this extreme pride in one's ethnicity may be called uh, ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism is not simply being uh, 
uh, part of an ethnic group, but being uh, slightly uh, what may be called uh, uh, more than belonging, but feeling of superiority. Unfortunately, there are uh, very few who are ethnically sensitive and at the same time who are not consciously or subconsciously, overtly or silently proud, and not just proud, but feel their culture is almost superior to any other culture. And this is uh, uh, something with which one grows up. It is not accurate to say that only some ethnic groups feel superiority. This is a very intrinsic aspect of uh, ethnicity. Now, needless to say, much of this is imaginary. It is not that uh, uh, that is justification for uh, any kind of superiority, but most of it is uh, imaginary. And the positive thing about this ethnocentrism is that it is a celebration and sharing of one's culture with others. And that is the important thing which, uh, uh, for which we should probably, uh, in a way, celebrate ethnocentrism because more people are not only aware of, but they have reason to be uh, proud of their culture. But taken to extremes, you have what's called cultural chauvinism, which is basically not just recognizing, but overplaying the greatness of one's inheritance. Uh, named as uh, you probably know after Nicolas Chauvin, a real or imaginary character in French history who was extremely and excessively proud of being French or France. And, but this is, of course, in our own times, the term has uh, uh, been modified. Its meaning is uh, uh, often associated with male superiority, but that was not the original meaning of chauvinism. Every culture has its chauvinist thinkers. Many poets, politicians, and even common people are chauvinists in their own ways. And uh, that comes with being proud of, but a little exaggerated. Now, there was a time when this kind of chauvinism, well, there was a time means in, let's say in the second half of the 19th, 20th century, people would uh, uh, in many cases uh, look down upon or laugh at this. But you in our own times, as we all know, this chauvinism, which is also uh, finds expression as uh, nationalism, extreme nationalism is uh, almost uh, breathing fire, one might say. Now, like religion, ethnicity unites people. And to that extent, it is probably good, but it also divides people. And that is the negative aspect, the more serious, to some extent dangerous aspect of uh, uh, ethnocentrism. And moreover, it also, in many cases justifiably, in some cases not so justifiably, insecure in the presence of people of other ethnic groups. And this causes mutual uh, distrust and rivalry. 
And it is unfortunate that the divisive aspect of cultures instead of the unifying aspect has very unfortunate consequences, uh, negative consequences in people's lives and in the uh, lives of uh, communities. Now, conflicts can be within a yeah, uh, group, or it can be amongst, and there are all kinds of uh, multi, uh, in the multi-ethnic world, conflicts which arise through to uh, economic factors, historical factors, and uh, uh, also related to the fact that there have been all through history some dominant cultures for which uh, people in most countries have very little respect. And by what do we mean by dominant? Because they have not only dominated the world scene, but they have also exploited weaker peoples. And this is, this is all over the world. It is not simply one part of the world. And they have also impacted on the culture of other nations, other peoples. Let's say uh, they have carried more weight than the people of the, the local people. Some of these are forgotten, some are very much persistent. And what this leads to is that uh, the, this, the difficulty of people of one culture who for some reason or other live in another country, culture. And there is uncertainty in their lives. There is the insecurity in many cases and they respond to it by several ways. One is by self-assertion. They don't care what uh, the majority says or very often they also condemn the majority in uh, so many ways. Now, what is the cause of Islamism? As we said, it is the fear of losing one's ethnic identity. If one is a minority in a country, then the idea of losing one's ethnic identity comes from the famous assimilation process. And it also wants to restore the past glories of the particular culture. And another important factor is in the modern world, every culture wants to occupy the uh, world stage. And this is possible, this is one of the results of what we call uh, the internet world in which we live, where everything is exposed and exaggerated and misrepresented. So let us talk of universality. Universality is a vision that recognizes particular affiliations as having important but only relative significance. It is important to realize that it, it's an ideal of a peaceful world in which all ethnicities and nations will live together. It's very much an ideal, but very much also in the world is in dire need of some universalist perspectives. Now, enlightened universe, universality calls for the inclusiveness of all cultures and perspectives. It is uh, also respect for all cultures and freedom to accept or reject perspectives. This is very important. It is important to emphasize, recognize and even emphasize this aspect of universality. It is not acceptance of everything. In the classical world, 
there have been many great thinkers in every culture where the concept of universality has been expressed. The Roman writer Terence said, homo sum humani nil ame alienum puto, I am human and I regard nothing as alien, which is not human. Uh, there was a Tamil poet by the name of Kanian who more than a thousand years ago said, Yadum ure yavarum kelir, which means everywhere is my town, everyone is my kid and kin. You have the famous statement, then he may atinous e Corinthios a la politis ton cosmos. Ancient saying by Diogenes, and what it simply means is, I am not an Athenian or a Corinthian, but a citizen of the world. In the Hindu tradition, there is a famous saying, Vasudeva Kudumbagam, which means, it simply it's a very ancient statement from the Maha Upanishad. It, say, it simply means the earth is a family. In the 18th century, Buffon said, Long blanc en Europe, noir en Afrique, jaune en Asie, et rouge en Amérique, n'est que le même homme. De la du climat. Man who is white in Europe, black in Africa, yellow in Asia, and red in America is always, it's only the same. It is all the result of climate, the difference of colors. Or again, we have St. Francis of Assisi, who long ago said, Fratelli tutti, all brothers, all our brothers, a term which was used recently by the Pope, I think. Now, the impact of the 18th century enlightenment is extremely important, often misunderstood or ill-understood or not recognized. And that is that from the individual privileges to collective rights, it's an entirely new concept of human history and respect for and tolerance for all religions is also an idea which came about only primarily, I would say, in the uh, 18th century. As a result of which we hear Frederick Schiller, the famous in his Ode to Joy, he said, Alle Menschen read the Bruder. Some of us must have heard it in Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And simply, all uh, we are all brothers. The other important development historically is that whereas religions preach what may be called interpersonal uh, ethics, which is to treat others with love and respect. Uh, one result of, 19th of, uh, of the Enlightenment was intergroup ethics. And this is an entirely different new uh, concept in human history. You treat not just your fellow human, but other groups with the same kind of uh, thing. And all the th things we have today, uh, the great international organizations, these are all the result of what might be called intergroup ethics. I'm bringing, reminding ourselves of all these because there are so, that so much we are disappointed with and depressed about what's happening in the modern world, but there are many, many positive things which have also arisen in human history. Now, what are the challenges to universality? First, there is some first, national self-interest, then 
there are deep divides between those who have more in age, I'm talking about cultures and within cultures who have more and who have less. And then we cannot forget uh, the oppressors and victims that has been all through history and that we constantly remind ourselves of in this day of enlightenment and recognition of uh, past blunders, at least by some cultures. It is very, very important to recognize that these play a role in accepting universality. Now, respecting the non-hurtful aspects of all cultures and religions, as I said, is an important aspect of uh, being uh, in a culturally sophisticated world. And it is equally important to allow others to have their own cultural framework. It's a conscious recognition of these, especially the non-hurtful aspects, which is very important, unfortunately, not inculcated sufficiently. It is important to recognize that universality is not, does not mean accepting everything good and bad in all cultures. And uh, if there is religious intolerance in one culture, we openly repudiate them. But there is also the problem of uh, can you repudiate it openly? Say, is there a limit to free speech? These are some unrealistic or difficult or challenging questions to universality, which made, in the view of many, universalism as uh, really fatally flawed. Now, it is important to have a certain psychological framework, and that is one should have full confidence in one's own culture without comparing it with others in order to be fully emancipated. There should be no fear of one's own culture being threatened, and there should be full economic equality amongst the peoples of the world. So uh, it may surprise us to know that science is universal, transcending race and nationality. That's not a sur surprise, but only practicing scientists and sympathizers of science understand its virtues. And in that sense, that is an ethnic aspect to science, as we all know. This is equally true of religion, which has universality on the one hand. And on the other hand, it has also uh, a certain, uh, I mean, to begin with, it has exclusivism, which is not universality, ethnocentric, but it is also universal in. Uh, many other ways. So uh, what is the challenge to conclude? Ethnicity and universality are complementary aspects of being human, especially uh, in a society. Somewhat like what physicists would call the wave particle duality, which means that a particle can be both a wave and a particle depending on the uh, circumstances. So it is important to maintain a balance between the two rather than adapting one or the other as the correct one. And I would therefore conclude by simply uh, referring to a Sanskrit prayer which says, Loka Samastha Sukhinu Bhavantu, may everybody in the world be happy. And I think uh, with that, I will conclude because I'm keeping uh, an eye on the clock here. We are, I have probably uh, 
if not exceeded, certainly uh, try to maintain uh, within the time. And uh, I hope we will have some uh, hearty discussions on my remarks. Thanks so Thank much, Phoebe. That was really dynamic talk. Very grateful for it. Um, we next have uh, with us a respondent. Okay, and uh, the respondent to this work to, to Vivi is going to be the Reverend Janet Newton. She was raised in Los Alamos, New Mexico, now lives on Martha's Vineyard with her wife, Maria, and two children, Ryan and Larkin. She's been a lifelong Unitarian Universalist. Um, in 2014, she shifted from teaching high school in English and philosophy to going into uh, the ministry. Um, she's done a lot of work with religious naturalism. Uh, she, she also feels this sort of uh, strong connection to geography and landscapes from both New Mexico and Martha's Vineyard. She currently serves on the board and as, a, as an advisor for the Religious National Naturalist Association. And you know, our, her tie with Iris is that she was the chaplain for the 2021 conference on Star Island, which focused on religious na naturalism. Um, she was she served uh, as a federated uh, Universalist uh, UCC church setting in central Massachusetts for four years, and then moved uh, uh, just just uh, you know in the past few years earlier this month to her new position um, with uh, the Unitarian Universalist Society of North Martha's Vineyard. So uh, Reverend Janet, we're really happy to have you. Grateful that you could join us. If you will um, unmute and uh, start your video, we'll be happy to see you. I can't start my video because the host has stopped it, so. Okay, uh, uh, CJ, can you make the video be available? There we go. Thank you. Great, great. Hello. Thank you so much for the invitation to respond, and thank you so much for um, those thoughts, um, Dr. Rowan. I'm um, grateful to be invited into the space and to to um, use the fodder that you have given us. Um, as we explore the possibilities of this universality. And I, I have to say that, um, you know, I think um, one of the things that I was struggling with uh, as, I was, as I was listening was this, um, the difference between the ethno, ethnocentrism and religiocentrism and how easy it is for them to become really interrelated um, such that there's the division that occurs um, can fall along those worldview lines that are constructed by religion as opposed to being constructed by ethnicity. Um, and, and I think especially when they get blended, when you have a, 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 a ethnic identity that gets so connected to a religious identity that those who belong to the ethnic identity stop, to qu stop questioning what it is that makes them believe the way that they do. They just have this sort of shared assumption that of course everybody is believing the same way that I do because I have this shared ethnic identity, um, but it may produce radically different worldviews depending upon how the religion is expressed. And, um, and so I'm, I'm intrigued by you know, how easy it is to operate on uh, on assumptions, if we share identity in some capacity, you must agree with me about something, which can allow us to band together and start to um, see ourselves as superior and see others as as um, as lesser than. And and you know, you you point out these historic, going all the way back to the ancient um, Greeks and and the, these historic ways of seeing universality, I was thinking about the Ottoman Empire and the way that that they had the capacity to hold within them radically different religious groups by saying, we, we invite you to take care of your problems that are interreligious within your society if it affects, if it goes across you know, if the if the Jewish person and the Muslim have a conflict, then we're going to have to deal with it. But but other than that, we're going to ask you to handle your own problems. And then since then, we've gotten very far away from that. We've gotten into you know things like the former Yugoslavia and and Rwanda and places where ethnic identity and ethnic um, 
you know, the, the, the bloodbath of, of ethnicity has really been um, played out in the late 20th um, century. Um, and so for me, I was just thinking about how many unexamined assumptions we have when we uh, adopt an identity that is related to ethnicity. Um, and um, for those people who identify as white in America, so many have no knowledge whatsoever <laughs> of what their actual ethnic identity might be other than adopting a skin color. So when you talk about things like, oh, food or um, you know, art and music or literature and poetry, there may not be anything that's very shared other than that, that, than that which has been imposed by say the canon. Um, but like when I, if I said, what are the white foods <laughs> um, in America? Um, most people have very unexamined assumptions about that. They think whatever I believe must be the thing that is shared, pumpkin spice lattes or whatever it may be. Um, and I think that, that poses a challenge to getting us to universality because there is this historic colonialism. There's this history of, of, of white supremacy. There's this history of sort of assuming that that um, the winners in history were right, um, and we don't have to ask or understand or interrogate any of our assumptions. Um, so um, that that's what you have me thinking about uh, in this moment. And and I wanted to ask you, um, where or how do you envision the pulling apart um, of ethnic identity and religio identity? Uh, especially when one produces something hypocritical or paradoxical in the other um, because of unexamined assumptions. Do Vivi, do you want to go ahead and answer that? Yeah. Well, right. uh, first I'd like to say that historically, most religions have been ethnic. Whether you go to the ancient Greeks or the Romans, or the uh, Nordic people, the North religion, or the American Indian Aztecs, most of these religions have been very ethnic. In the modern world, there are two kinds of religion. There are ethnic religions and what you may call more universal. The two important ethnic religions in today's world are Judaism and Hinduism, by which I mean you become a member of that religion by being born in that religion, and then you have the freedom maybe to convert or not. Very, it's very recent conversion into some of the ethnic religions. Whereas the other major religions, namely Buddhism, Christianity, and Islam, are non ethnic. So it is, uh, without passing value judgments, I will simply say that uh, the, uh, it is not universal, the idea of religions being ethnic uh, uh, or transcending ethnicity, other than uh, Buddhism, Christianity, and uh, Islam, no, there are invariably these are uh, religion, that means religions which proselytize. That's the difference. But Janet, do you have any comments back? Well, I'm just thinking about the former Yugoslavia and the way in which, the, you know, of course it was, you're talking about proselytizing religions that were fighting with each other, but, um, but there was so much ethnic connection as a consequence of that. So at a certain point, you know, my identity as, as a Muslim transcended my identity as, a, you know, a Yugoslavian or, or within that, right, you know, going deeper down or my identity as a, as a Hutu transcended. Um, and I think even within Islam, you could say my identity as a Sunni transcends my, my relationship to those who are, who are Shia. So, Shia. so Again, I, I recognize that you're you're saying there are examples of universality of religions of universality, um, but because they don't proselytize, <laughs> I think the challenge is how do you get the the positive aspects of those of, of those religions to 
um, counteract the inclination within the proselytizing religions to really um, run roughshod over um, using, you know, using empire, using colonialism, using history, the history of oppression. Okay. Um, well, if, 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 you've been, if you don't have any more discussion to go back and forth, I think I'll start to turn to some of the questions. Uh, Vivi, there's, there, there are rich questions in the uh, Q&A box. And I want to remind the audience that um, if you do have any questions, please enter them in the Q&A box uh, so we can have discussion. Uh, that's how we're taking our questions uh, uh, this time around. Um, first question, what if the culture is informed by doublespeak, saying one thing and acting in the opposite, like the 2000 years of Christian history speaking love and yet acting in hate, genocide, violence, pedophilia, etc.? Vivi, do, do you want to try to answer that? Uh, the question is the difference between theory and practice. In yeah, pretty much. What they're saying is that sometimes it's you say yeah. the religion says one thing, but it does something very different. Yeah, I uh, my uh, general comment will be, even though the reference was made to Christianity, this is not uh, unique to Christianity. Uh, probably in all religions. There are practitioners who go way against the much nobler ethical principles that are enunciated by their respective uh, uh, leaders or prophets, whatever. Uh, and the uh, way to get over it uh, is probably to recognize the historical uh, dimension of a religion and to realize that certain things that we practice and take for granted today uh, might have been appropriate at a distant age, at a distant time when the religion was promulgated. But we need to get over the historical uh, chains which bind the practice and the beliefs in many religions. All religions have been evolving to an extent in that sense, except probably their uh, reluctance to give, uh, give up some of the very basic uh, uh, beliefs uh, uh, in their scriptures. But actually, there is so much positive they can take without adhering to the historical roots. Great, uh, thanks, thanks for your next question. Can you speak about the human crisis that seems to lead us toward extinction faster and faster? Why is this happening and why can't we learn better? What are your insights? I don't hear what you You want me to say it again? I can, I'll say it slower. Uh, slow, slow, slower will help, yeah, thank okay. you. Can you speak about the human crisis that seems to lead us toward extinction faster and faster? Yeah. Can you speak to the human crisis yeah. that seems to be leading us to extension, uh -huh. extinction faster and faster? Well, I, I think there are, uh, in that way, context two different crises which are leading to extinctions. There are, I think first, maybe minor, is the, the, the kind of uh, political things that are happening all over the world, which would lead to the extinction of that particular systems. And that is one thing. And uh, the other more serious thing is the extinction of the species as a result of the uh, infamous climate change. And uh, there are, I personally uh, like to think that we can, it is not too late uh, by reversing certain aspects of our uh, behavior. But I am afraid uh, the, uh, those who think it is too late may be correct in this matter. I'm very, very pessimistic about that. Thanks, Vivi, that's great. Um, 
the um, next question. So name one culture that doesn't react out of fear. That doesn't name one culture that does not react out of fear. Uh, very, very uh, good question. I, uh, in the modern world, if one is part of mainstream humanity, I think fear, especially of losing one's culture, is so rampant that depending on how severe it is, the reaction is goes all the way from ugly to disastrous. And I think the question is very, very pertinent. Uh, the answer is I don't know of any culture, except maybe some cultures in some remote regions in the Amazons, which have even they, if they have interacted with the so-called mainstream civilizations, they would react out of fear. Thank you, Vivi. And next, next question, economic, inequality contributed to the French and communist revolutions. Will this economic inequality lead to a revolution in the US? Was the January 6th insurrection a precursor to such a revolution? I, uh, it's a very difficult, it's very risky to predict historically. There is no question, but that the French revolution and the revolutions in, uh, let's say, Russia, China, and other communist countries resulted from absolutely intolerable economic uh, inequality and uh, coupled with uh, exploitation and total indifference. However, uh, and that could happen uh, in today's uh, maybe the United States elsewhere too, but it depends on whether the lower or the oppressed classes are completely bereft of the basic needs of subsistence economically or whether they get a minimum. And I think as long as there is a minimum available to everyone through welfare, and that's the whole idea of welfare, maybe, and which resulted from understanding the consequences of uh, uh, you know, such inequality, uh, there may not be an economic uprising. That could be other reasons for uprising, but economic, uh, as long as everybody gets a minimum in food and clothing and shelter, perhaps by everybody, I mean 99%, then it is not likely. Okay, great. Um, next question. Could you expand on your message to consider species level centrism? That is anthropocentrism in particular. So could you consider species level cent centrism, particularly thinking about anthro human centrism? <laughs> Could you consider species uh, no, no, species uh, uh, ethnocentrism, oh. species ethnocentrism, and in particular, um, um, human, uh, uh, anthro, anthro, was that the word? Anthrocentrism. Oh, species. Anthro, anthrocentrism, oh, yeah. right. Anthropocentrism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, anthropocentrism. Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, there is no question, but that. Uh, species and, uh, or anthropocentrism is uh, has always been there amongst humans. And from a philosophical, biological, and uh, overall enlightened perspective, there is no justification for regarding one species as superior to another or as having more right to live on the planet than another. However, 
from well, for historical reasons and practical reasons and mostly non-reflective reasons, uh, it is assumed by most of us that we humans have yeah, a greater right. And that our everyday behavior is based on that, whether when you see a mosquito or whether you build uh, a new city in places where animals lived before. Okay, Vivi, um, I, I have a question I want to ask, um, and it's kind of similar to what Reverend Janet was asking earlier. So I'm Ukrainian, and it there is a war going on in Ukraine, and it seems as though culture is being used to fight this war. Russia is telling one story of Ukrainian history and Ukraine is telling a different story of Ukrainian history. How do you think that fits into the things that you've been talking about? Well, the way I see it, no matter uh, how history is presented, in the world in which we live today, I am not sure that a country, and this is a transition from, uh, uh, I don't know, previous times, that a country by sheer military power can walk into another country uh, to access or to assimilate it and make it part of it. That is what is, although this is nothing new, even in the 20th century, it has happened all over, I mean, in the 1930s, uh, but, and one could point to uh, other places like the Iraq war, Vietnam war, but in those cases, the, the later ones, uh, one did not, the United States did not assimilate those countries into their own. They did invade them for various reasons. So here, I really don't know. I cannot, uh, what is sad in the whole thing is that the might is right principle is still uh, very much alive. And uh, depending on who uh, exercises it when and where, and the world, the majority, we cannot do anything. We, this happens we, in Ethiopia and other parts of the world also. But the Ukraine thing is a more glaring thing that we read about. Can I, can I just yeah. sure, please. clarify her yeah. question? Uh, she, uh, it is, uh, yeah, she said in the Ukraine-Russia uh, uh, war, uh, Russia presents one scenario of the history of the country and the Ukrainians present a different uh, yeah. history of their country. And so how, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. You comment about it? Yeah, I, that is true, but the, the history is, aside from the history, it's a matter of which, who has a right to walk into another country and make it part of itself, even if they, now we can, uh, present. There are many cases where one can give uh, uh, that kind of an explanation for uh, gobbling another country. So I don't know. It is very difficult. Thanks, Vivi. There's one last question. This will be the last question that we'll have. How much of human problems grow out of a worldview of domination and illusion of control? as opposed to reverence and respect for nature and the whole world? Yeah, sadly, uh, sadly uh, domination and uh, power, they have played the role in history more often than not. And one of the hopeful uh, ideals of the Enlightenment movement was precisely to arrest that. But 
from that point of view, it has not been that successful. And we can, given the conditions of the world, we can only pray for peace. And that is, uh, and that's why I ended my uh, thing with a Sanskrit mantra, which is a prayer for peace. That's all we can do as ordinary citizens. Okay. Um, I think with that, we are, we, we've answered the questions. Vivi, I want to thank you for a really inspirational, fabulous talk. Uh, Reverend Janet, thank you so much for your comments and for your discussion. This was really a great session.